Does everyone have stickers on today? Yes. Yeah? Good. If not, there's some extra stickers over there. Uh, Sorry about the technical issues, obviously. Um, when Justin asked me to come in and give a talk for Creative Mornings, I was really excited that one of my choices was magic. And primarily because I'm the kind of person that when you go out, I see magic in, in the small things in everyday life, in the little things that can bring you joy, in the way that the sun sparkles, in the way that you know, stickers feel when you put them on, in the strawberry in the morning, basically anything that you can see, smell, touch, taste, feel, it just for me that's life and that's joy. And currently what we're working on is figuring out a way how we can use that joy and harness all of our senses and into creating a kinder, happier future. And that's kind of what we believe in. Um, so let's talk about magic for a second. Um, the actual definition is an extraordinary power influence from a supernatural force, which I find interesting because we often talk about magic as something that's not real. And that kind of brought me to thinking, well, when you Google this, what happens? Like, what's the antonym of magic? It turns out the antonym of magic is actually reality, which is then defined as the quality or state of being real. How does that help us? Reality, or real, is actually, it says, being or occurring in fact or actuality, having a verifiable existence, true and actual, not imaginary, alleged, or ideal. The question is, how do you actually verify the existence? What does that mean? How are we verifying who we are today? Um, interesting little other factoid I found when looking up um, reality is the year 1550. That's when the word reality first started to be used by us humans in common language. Now, this year is an interesting year for a couple of reasons. A couple other things happened in the 15, well, not exactly 1550, but the 1500s. One of them was that this defines a really clear shift of philosophy, moving from ancient Greek philosophy or ancient philosophy, where it was actually believed that the human being or the man was good, and philosophy centered around what are our ideals, what are we striving for, never being able to achieve the perfect ideal, but there was always this reality was never actually the perfection that we were striving for. It was always out there. Um, and then come 1550, you get the beginning of modern thought. And that's where we are today. This is modern thought. And modern thought defines the uh, man as actually being bad. So you have Machiavelli and Hobbes in political theory thinking that humans are bad, and we start defining societies and everything we build around that. Another very interesting thing happened around the 1500s. Uh, Magellan sailed around the world. Now this was not the first time that humans thought the world was round, but in our modern thought, we claim 1500s as the world being round. Weirdly, Google had a lot of trouble finding out who first discovered the world was round. Talk about knowledge. Which brings me to the next point. Um, if reality is perception and perception is reality, then how do we actually, how do we test that? How do we know? And what does knowing mean? We, today we tend to think about, you know, scientific method means we follow a specific set of rules, we can reprove it, but what does that mean? Science is actually only looking at what we've observed. And what we can observe comes the question of how do we actually observe? So how do we perceive? Um, we perceive through our senses is the answer to that. And because I like my definitions, uh, the Webster Dictionary also said that sense is a specialized function or mechanism by which an animal receives and responds to external or internal stimuli. It can also be conscious awareness or rationality. Um, a current company today, we define a sense as anything that can define your, that can influence your physiology, your brain chemistry, or your perception. Uh, we have eight senses. We consider senses to be sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, position, movement, and language. These are all things that when you think about it, well, not me think about it, but when you look into neuroscience, will affect your brain chemistry, which then will affect your physiology, which then will affect how you feel, how you interact, and ultimately how you perceive the world. Um, a little quick example on this, if you're feeling really sick, you're probably not going to go out and talk to somebody and you're probably going to think the whole world kind of sucks. Kind of just happens like that. But that's also your biology telling you to take care of yourself because you just need, that's what you need to be, like you need to be alone to be better, feel better. Um, I did not come across my <laughs> Let's ignore that slide. Um, <laughs> So that slide was actually a diagram that showed what, the, what human senses do. 
And what they are is they're, they're there for us to define our basic needs from an evolutionary biology perspective. So they help us identify danger. In the early days, is there a lion gonna come get you or not? Do you run or do you stay and fight? Uh, it helps you identify food. And once you find the food, it helps you evaluate, is it something that you can eat or is it something that might kill you? It helps you find the right mate. Is this the right person that you can have lots of babies with or not? And I also add to that something that's maybe a little bit unusual, it's, it's children. We have a, another sense that helps to protect things that are cute. So that's why we think all puppies and kittens and young animals or mammals or humans or any kind of species are cute so we don't kill them. Um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> another thing that our senses help us do, and we can talk about love because it's Friday morning and it's like the easiest way to help us explain how our senses are important and how we interact and perceive the world. So, going through the senses really quickly, when our sense of sight, we evaluate somebody, and there's a lot of studies showing that a really high number of people find symmetrical faces to be the most attractive. Um, so that's when you evaluate someone with sight, that's one of the things that works on our, our brain right away. Uh, interestingly enough, tonality of voice as well. So they, were, they ran studies between men and women and found that women found deeper voices to be more attractive and, and men found higher voices to be more attractive. Uh, in terms of smell, which is my field actually, is uh, there's a study that also shows that you know, um, two scientists in Switzerland called um, Mininsky and Vedefeld had a bunch of people, a bunch of men wear t-shirts for three days, shower, they could shower, but not smoke or eat like really spicy food, and they had women evaluate these t-shirts, and they found that the women that were not on the pill found the t-shirts that smelled the best to be of men coming from an opposite um, immunology on their genes, so they had an opposite MHC compatibility. So basically it would help them have non-recessive traits with their offspring. Women on the pill had the opposite effect. So, just a little bit of trivia. Without your senses, you wouldn't be able to identify the right person for you, or you know, anyone. Um, and I'd like to kind of do a little bit of an experiment right now. So if you play with me for a little bit, and trust me, and everybody would close their eyes just for a second. Well, a couple seconds. And as you close your eyes, I would like you to think about what it is, you know, where are you right now? You can't see where you are, but what can tell you where you are? What do you hear? You hear my voice, maybe? Maybe you hear some music? Perhaps the sound on the gravel as I walk? Maybe some clacking of plates? Maybe all of those things tell you that you're in the bar. And now imagine that you couldn't hear and focus on what you smell. What do you smell right now? Do you smell your you're wearing cologne, maybe your neighbor's cologne or perfume. Do you smell coffee? Do you smell the laundry detergents that your clothes were washed in? Maybe the shampoo you put on your hair or a lotion you had? Uh, do you smell the plants? Do you smell the gravel underneath us, maybe the lights? And now for a second, imagine you didn't have sight, you didn't have hearing, and you didn't have your sense of smell. Uh, what's left? Think about what you feel. And that's a really interesting, elusive sense, more on that later. Do you feel the chair that you're sitting on? Perhaps one leg crossed over the other. Do you feel your feet on the floor? What kind of floor is it? Does it make a difference? Can you tell that it's not wooden? Is it maybe uneven? What does that tell your body? Do you feel your jacket or your shirt on your skin? Do you maybe feel your neighbor's arm? Maybe a breeze? Now imagine you didn't feel that. Where would you be? What would the world look like? What would exist? What would you understand? Um, now you can open your eyes. Thank you. Um, so for me, the world of magic is very much the magic ability that we can actually be here living and perceive the world. And I've probably annoyed a lot of my friends lately with the thought experiment that kind of went well, what happens if thought is a virus and nothing actually exists and this is not the talk is about this, things I like to think about. But what happens in this world that we claim is real, that we need to perceive in order to prove reality, that we need to understand in order to make it exist? But if we don't have our senses, as we just noticed, 
We don't know that we're in a room. We don't know what this room looks like. We don't know what color the chairs are. We don't know what form the chairs have. We don't know what the floor is. We don't know where we are. Interesting thing about touch is that you lose your entire perception of where you are in space when you lose it. Interesting thing about smell has when you lose your sense of smell, it has the highest suicide rate of all the senses. And so on. Your senses tell you where you are in the world and what you do. And so, what is understanding, actually? So, all of our senses tell us where the world is. It's this layer that we have between who we are and what we perceive, and then what we understand. It comes through a feedback loop and it comes to our brains. And if you remember, there was language on that list of senses as well. Language is an interesting one, because language not only is something that we've created, and we happen to have 6,500 languages on this planet, and I don't know if you guys think that makes us understand each other more, but, you know, I don't, <laughs> necessarily. But the interesting thing about language is that the words we use also define the way that we feel, and they define the way that others feel. So, a lot of my friends have heard me say that the phenomenon of Twitter, which is a very much, you know, it's a snarky, comedy place, the more you use negative language, the more negative you become, which ultimately then changes the way that your brain is structured through the field of epigenetics we've learned that. So, use negative language, you get more negative, your brain changes, you pass it on to your offspring. It's kind of scary. Uh, that's how things work. Um, so if we think about understanding as this layer of we perceive the world and we have language as an extra layer that helps us understand maybe what we already understand. Someone's a little lost, that's okay, this understanding is a little confusing. Um, but I found this, and I thought this little poem kind of made sense. And I kind of feel like this is where we are as a place in humanity, where we already exist and we already know, but we just forget that we know. So we're in this process of trying to scramble, to try and understand what it is the world around us is telling us. But we've forgotten that biology has given us all of these amazing tools to help us understand that. And it's not just humans that we can understand you look at this photo, I'm sure everyone can see what this emotion is. Or this one. And beyond emotion, if you look to nature, amazing things are happening. So this is a flock of birds, and this is something that we don't understand yet. How does a flock of birds fly in unison without any knowledge? There's no, there's no captain screaming, go left, go right, you know, one, two, three. They function. And so do plants, actually. And all living organisms have sensory systems. So this is, sensory perception is how living organisms function. A plant will turn to light and will grow where there is light, grow towards it. And, and this is kind of a wonderful thing. It's a very basic form, but it's understanding as, as much as you can have in nature. And um, yeah, a little throw in, your senses also, because they work with your brain, really affect the way that you feel. So they're kind of like the, the conductor or like the, you know, the remote control that tells you this is how many hormones you should produce, this is how much, this is the brain chemistry balance that you should have, that then tells the rest of your body how to function. So your senses not only help you perceive the world, they also tell you how to feel, and when to sleep, and when not to sleep, and when to be happy and stressed and sick, etc. It brings me to what we're doing today, and putting forward uh, this concept as multisensory design as epistemology. So, multisensory design and emotions as a way to structure knowledge, which is a little bit different than most people would think, but if we think about knowledge as what I've just described, then your emotions can actually be ultimate understanding and knowledge. So what does this mean? Why am I standing here? What am I doing? Um, I don't know, sometimes I ask myself the same thing, but the work that we're working on currently is translating all of these concepts into a design perspective that we can use. So using, designing our senses around one or multiple brain states to achieve a targeted result. So to make you feel better. And this year we're focusing on stress because we're designing for a kinder world and nobody can be kind when they're stressed. So later you'll be able to try one of the prototypes we're creating that, you know, plan one is to combat stress, plan two is, you know, make people better. This is a little thing, I'm sure everyone saw Beauty and the Beast, it wasn't just me as a teenager, but I tried to look up animate objects and this is all I could find. And one of the things that we're working on right now is combining multi-sensory design with data, technology, and living organisms to create animate objects. So it's our first prototype, actually. It's an object that will understand how you feel intuitively, well not intuitively, but initially through data and electronics, and then respond to your emotional needs by giving you what you want or what you need. 
The first prototype we're creating is a multi-sensory cocoon. It's a hanging environment that uses six senses to reduce stress levels. So the initial step is you'll walk into it and it'll just work on you. It's like instant meditation and it should work kind of help you feel better right away, but then also to reduce stress levels overall. Kind of like when you run, it, it boosts your heart rate so that when your heart rate can go down much quicker. And this is kind of the same thing for cortisol for stress. Um, but thinking a little bit of a step further, imagine what the world would look like if everything that we created was alive instead of dead, not sentenced for a landfill. But it was something that lived with us, something that understood how we felt, something that said, oh, you're hungry, here's some food. And maybe a little bit further, maybe you need a hug. How does the room, or how does your phone that you're playing with make you feel like you're, you're actually feeling loved when you're not loved? Or how can a chair help you focus if you need to focus? And how does the chair work in unison with the table that works in unison with your phone? And this is a step beyond IoT that we know today, which is not just things communicating. It's things communicating, but also with you and with our environments. So it can help you understand your dog. And it's a first step to bring us back to what it might be to understand on an actually intuitive level that we've forgotten. And if that's not so clear, feel free to ask me questions later. The next step from this is something that we, we've been calling responsive environments. And the example I tend to give a lot is an example of a tunnel. And a tunnel is an inherently scary place, especially for a woman, which I am, so that means my perspective. But if you look at this image, the girl is running away from the dark, like into the darkness, into the light. The reason tunnels are scary, or darkness can be scary, is you never know what's happening around you. In a tunnel, you have two entrance exit points. You, it generally echoes, so you're, for your girl, your heels are kind of going to go, and it's going to echo, and it's going to be really scary. You might know that somebody enters, but it's, all, it's really dim, and there's shadows, and you don't really know what's happening. So an example of a responsive environment following our design theory would be, um, you know, you'd walk into a tunnel, the tunnel would sense that you're there, and it would give you information when you need it. Meaning, it will tell you when you're not alone. So if somebody enters the tunnel, and you're like, this is a moment where maybe I need to be aware and alert, it could become brighter and help you identify a source of threat. And if it's not a threat, once you've understood that, it can get dimmer. So the idea is that we can use our senses not only to communicate, but also to help us achieve the things that we need. Um, it could also be that this cocoon that you'll try out later it can be an example of an entire room or an entire environment. If the interest, like, one of the interesting things about stress is that when you are stressed, you sweat through a different gland. And we can pick that up through our sense of smell. So if one person or more people are stressed, other people will pick that up, and when you pick that up, it triggers your personal fight or flight response, which makes you stressed until you identify that there is no source. So stress is almost contagious, like a disease. And what if everybody has that disease? And you know, about 90% of sickness is linked to it. And if we think about that, it's kind of insane, because that's something we've created. We create stress in our lives. So imagine we can uncreate stress in our lives by designing differently um, and creating different systems. Currently today, the systems we have are actually, I would say, at war with our sensory systems. How many of you, show of hands, had coffee this morning? All right. Whether you know it or not, it's probably not the best for your sleep-wake cycle. But, yeah, it kind of helps. It disrupts a little bit in the way that your, your hormones are produced. How many people looked at their phone before going to bed or at email? I know I did. Another one also disrupts your sleep cycle. It sets off a, there's a third receptor in our eye and that sets it off and that kind of inhibits the production of melatonin. So we're actually, the way that we're designing our world from our gadgets, our products, our lifestyles are at war with our natural biorhythms. And it's making us be sicker, it's making us feel worse and ultimately be less kind people. So what would the world look like if we started designing differently? Um, and in that difference, what happens when we go a step further, when we can actually learn how to replace electronics that are not biodegradable and taking our planet with actually bioinformation? What happens if we start building living systems and designing objects as such, where you create them to degrade with us, and so their degradation becomes a part of life, which is a part of our life cycle? Or what if they don't degrade with us, but they change? And in that change, carry more information to the next cycle. So what I'm proposing is not going back to the Ice Age, it's about really going forward in a way that is a more natural way that works with our biorhythms, that works with the planet's biorhythms and is good for everyone. And ultimately, when we get to the point where we can feel better, where we can understand one another intuitively again,
we can understand our planet, we understand our designs, we'll be able to understand other living creatures, we'll be able to understand the planet, and then hopefully get to a place where things are just kinder and moving forward. Um, I don't know if I have time still. And very quickly, this is a, I'd like to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in New York. Um, we're in a place, we're hosted by a company called 10X Beta, which is a, a medical device company at a, a maker space, which is more like a prototyping space called New Lab in Brooklyn Navy Yards. And uh, my business partner, Eleanor Samuelson, and I have been very kind of invited there to work on one of the concepts that we have, which we're calling the cocoon, which I mentioned before. These are just some brief sketches of what we've been doing. And this is Eleanor testing out <laughs> sound, so the, which she'll be testing out later. And to go through the concept, we've broken it down into, so some of the six senses, we have a one-point suspension, so hanging from one point, which balances brain waves. We have a sound environment that works on three different levels. One is um, a level of pink noise that's regenerative. Then we started playing with binaural beats. And binaural beats is the, the idea that you get one wave, one sound wave through one ear and another sound wave through the other. And the difference between the two sound waves is interpreted by your brain to be a third wave. And this has been used to do, you know, to, to induce different brain, like different brain wave states. And we're working around one that is um, that induces meditation. And in this hypothesis that, you know, what would happen if you listen through other parts of your body? So coming from smell, different different cells on your body have smell receptors, like the sperm cell, for example, has smell receptors. Very weird phenomenon. But one of the things that was recently discovered that we didn't know before. So what if different parts of our body had auditory receptors and could feel it and hear the sound, would that work? And so we started working with vibrational speakers and working with this very specific vibration to get sound into our body through different acupressure points. And this was Eleanor testing it. It turns out we both tried it and for seven minutes we didn't really want to get off ever. And just, I don't know, it was a really incredible feeling that I hope we can share with you today. And and going further, this is what we have so far. We have a circle that's a swing, and we're testing what that might look like suspended. On the left here is one of um, one of our team members who is a molecular biologist, because we've been working with a, quite an interdisciplinary team. So we have uh, Eleanor and I, uh, a molecular biologist. We have an architect helping us with some of the structural design. We have a sound engineer who's made the beautiful piece of music that you'll be hearing that'll work on your brainwaves, and a perfumer creating the scent that's also going to be part of this. And so on the left-hand side, we were playing with what does it look like in an echo chamber. And the interesting thing is that the sound in this echo chamber actually made it feel expansive. And just kind of, we don't have that here, but hopefully in the next time. And on the right-hand side, we were looking at what it would, would it be like if it wasn't actually a cocoon, and maybe it were angel wings that came and, and, and gave you a big hug while you were sitting there. Um, anyway, so thank you very much. I would like to end this talk, hopefully, by having you believe that magic is actually something that happens on an everyday level and that it's something that you can do daily for yourself and for others and maybe we can move the world in a different place together and I really hope that we can go on that journey. So thank you very much.